an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM Certified Wellness Coach. And welcome to this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Regional Master Instructor Marty Miller here with my fellow Regional Master Instructor and dear friend, Miss Wendy Bats. Wendy, how are you? I'm good, Marty. How are you? Awesome. You know, this is always my favorite time of the week. Uh, you say that every time. You know, one of these times I'm going to call you out and be like, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the coffee talk that, you know, they do on Tuesdays is equal. But, you know, I'd have to go solo on that. So this is why this wins out that, you know, I got a you know, partner in crime here. I love it. Well, you know what? Today's topic is going to be one that I know you hold very dear to your heart. And I know our producer is excited about it because we see it in the gym. But I don't think any of us, including myself, probably take advantage of these non-motorized treadmills or truly have a good understanding about the differences between the ones that have a motor and the ones that don't. So, Marty, I'm excited that you're going to kind of lead this session. I'm going to I'm going to join in when I can, but I'm going to like take it in um, as a learning session for myself. And um, I'm excited to get started. There's no pressure on me then. But I think, Wendy, one of the things we need to do is if we talk about this is next time we're in a facility, I'm just going to put you through a bunch of the different workouts about the non-motorized. And then you can do, you know, a testimonial. Uh, happy to do so. I mean, I do use it with my, my athletes. I will say that. And like I said, there are certain things that I absolutely love about this treadmill, but I'm sure there's a lot more I'm going to learn. Awesome. Well, let's jump into it. So, so go ahead. Uh, no, no, feel free. This is all you. I was just going to say that basically that's what we're talking about here today on the master instructor round table with Marty Miller and myself. We're talking about these non-motorized treadmills. So we're going to talk about why to use them, what are the advantages, and then do some comparison between the motorized and non-motorized, talk about some exercises that you can do or different things to be creative in your programming, but then talk about like, should you use it for, you know, is it mainly for everyone or do we need to be very specific in our programming on, on our clientele and when, when best to program it? I like it. So I'll jump in here. So what I like about the non-motorized is there's a reason that these treadmills are created without a motor. It's not because, hey, we can save money, make it cheaper because we don't have a motor. No, there's truly a scientific principle behind it. So the way I look at it is a lot of people can figure it out very quickly. Well, if it's not motorized, you are the motor. Absolutely. So had to put a Ferrari in there. But to me, the first and foremost part is if I'm the motor, that also means I'm the brakes. So the cool part about that is if I'm on a motorized treadmill, and there's a lot of great value in motorized treadmills. Don't get me wrong. And actually, Wendy, you and I have talked about bringing this up at a later date. But here we want to talk about the advantage of the non-motorized is if I'm on a motorized treadmill, I can pick a speed and all I have to do is pick my foot up just a little bit and the belt's going to pass underneath me. As long as I'm finding a way to pick my foot up just a little bit quicker than a belt, quote unquote, I'm walking or running at X amount miles per hour where on a motorized, you are the motor. So if you need to get to seven miles an hour, you have to biomechanically get that belt moving at seven miles an hour. The other part of that though is rarely why I let someone, what I call jump the rails. Jumping the rails would be you get going fast and then you hold the handles and jump off. The only time that that is a safe part of a program is if you're dealing only with elite athletes and you're letting them do over speed training. But even with our sprinters, very rarely is that, something that they do all the time. So the key part is if I speed up to seven, eight, nine, 10, whatever, even four miles an hour, I want to see, can I control and slow down that speed? Because Wendy, you and I've talked about this countless times that you can't have the Ferrari engine if you don't have the Ferrari brakes. 
or if I'm on a motorized treadmill, even if I get going at seven or eight, nine or whatever miles per hour, when I hit slow down or stop, I'm not truly slowing myself down. I'm slowing down as the belt slows down. So right off the bat, that is, and I don't care if you're walking or running, doesn't matter, is I want to be able to get to the speed that's the right speed for me. And I want to see if I can slow myself down. So I'm controlling both the motor and the brakes. Perfect. Perfect analogy there, Marty. And, and I will say too, I mean, you know, before we did, um, you know, bring in the non-motorized treadmills, I mean, you're exactly right. I would have my athletes, you know, take, you know, spread them on the rails. And then when I said that it's their time to go and I say, go, they just jump right back into it. So, and, and then, as you said, just a gradual decrease depending on the belt, but it's the same thing when you're, you know, if you slow down with the belt and then you're trying to increase, you've got to wait for the actual motor to catch up to that speed versus it being full acceleration of what that athlete can actually do on their own because we're at the mercy of the belt and, and the motor itself. So I, I really think that's a very, very important part that you, or a point that you make. And, um, and yes, as you said, you don't want Ferrari brakes and like pin, your uh, motor with a like Pinto and nothing against Pinto, but I'm saying he's looking at two different cars um, with those yeah. brakes. It would probably not go well. No. And the other thing too, that you just made me think about, I, I would use this, I kind of call it laddering. So again, I don't care about the speed because everybody can use these. It could be one mile an hour or two to three miles an hour, or I've seen people at 22 miles an hour on these. That the, So the number is immaterial. But Wendy, as you talked about is if somebody gets going at eight miles an hour and that's their sprint and you want them to recover, you have them jump the rails because by the time you bring it back down to five, you're almost ready for them to start sprinting again. So you're losing the ability to decelerate every single time. So that's why I love this because I could say, get up to eight, bring it down to five, bring it down to three, bring it back up to five, bring it down to four. So it's really, really good to be able to control different speeds. Plus, if you have me going at eight or 10 miles an hour and I'm stationary and I jump on, I immediately have to go at 10 miles an hour. That's not what would happen in real life if I was on, the, on a field or a court. I would have to go from zero miles an hour to 10. So there's more practical application to that speed acceleration and deceleration with the curve non-motorized. Plus, I mean, let's be real here. If I had to do, let's say, 10 miles an hour, and that's my full-blown sprint on a motorized treadmill, I mean, it's flat. But if I'm on a non-motorized and you tell me to go 10 miles an hour, it is way harder because I have nothing to help me other than my own speed. And so, you know, it is a little bit of a give and take if someone's like, oh, I was on this motorized thing and this is how I, you know, how I'm, I'm, I'm doing my speed work. I mean, absolutely something is better than nothing, but there are some definite advantages to the non-motorized for sure. Now, this is one of my favorites. So I'll let you, I mean, jump right in here or. No, go ahead. Cool. So when I first found uh, these non-motorized shovels, I started using them myself. I was analyzing like, oh, I'm feeling this here. Oh, I'm allowed to do this. Oh, this can happen. So I, you know, you and I've used this term uh, many times. It's something that I've always kind of used is what I call accidental exercise. So why I'm doing A, do I get B, C, and D kind of just because I'm doing A? And the more bang for the buck that I can get, right, it saves time. It's a more complete total body uh, training or exercise. And that's how the body works. So with the skill, uh, the non-motorized treadmills, what happens as you're trying to move that belt, you have to lengthen your stride. So you have to get into hip extension. You also have to, with your front foot, you have to dorsiflex. So how many people are weak in their anterior tib? You cannot shuffle. You cannot not activate your anterior tib on a curved non-motorized treadmill because you're going to kick the tread. So it forces you to change your biomechanics very quickly without having to overthink it and overcoach it. But all, then all you, you get all these extra benefits. The research has been done. You get more core activation because I can't lean forward or I would get going too fast. I'd automatically stand up. You also burn about 9% more calories, plus or minus, if I'm going three miles an hour on a motorized versus a non-motorized. So we get more caloric expenditure, more cardiovascular work. As you'll see, it's going to be great for our seniors for fall prevention. So I'm happy if they get on a, a motorized treadmill, but if you're a shuffler, you're only going to get better shuffling on a motorized treadmill. God bless them. They're doing activity, but it may not be the best use of their time if you had the choice of using one of these, because a lot of our seniors will fall because their strides are very, very short. 
They don't dorsiflex. They kind of stub their toe. They get their center of mass going forward and they don't have the right stride length and then they fall. So by spending time on something like the curve non-motorized, they're more used to having a longer gait, better posture. And then as we just talked about before, I'm naturally changing my speeds as I would in real life, speeding up and slowing down. So these are just some of the benefits of what I call that accidental exercise. Oh, I absolutely agree. And, and I mean, to your points of exactly what you're saying too, Marty, you know, I do have um, seniors that we put on this treadmill. And to me, I think it's a little bit safer as well, because again, if they do lose their stride, then they're determining the speed of the belt versus me saying you have to stay at three um, because that's what I set that speed to and trying to maintain that might be a little much, or maybe I'm guessing and I'm, you know, so, so to me, it kind of takes the guesswork out along with all those definite advantages that you just talked about. I also find it safer because again, if someone does fall and it's a motorized, they hit it, that motor stays going at that speed. And I've seen people fall off treadmills. I've seen people, you know, like try to jump off really quick. You know, they lose their hand, they're holding onto the rails with their hands and they lose their, their, you know, um, they, they just lose their grip. I mean, a lot of things can happen. And again, I'm not saying that one is definitely better than the other. Again, something is better than nothing. That's all you have. There's a lot of advantages to that. Um, but I do, to me, I feel it's so much safer. And, um, and so if you guys are just joining Marty Miller and I today on um, the Master Instructor Roundtable, um, again, I'm Wendy Batts, and we are super excited to be talking about this topic specifically on no, non-motorized treadmills. And so, so far, we have talked a little bit about these advantages and again, we're talking about both advantages, something, do, do something is what we're saying. Cardio is important, whether you're walking or running. But if you haven't ever had the experience or never used these curved treadmills, they are so difficult. And like you said, if you're burning more calories and you can use it, why wouldn't you? Right. And, it, you know, the thing about it is the safety for sure, because Yes, for some people at first, it can look intimidating, but it, it can, if you are comfortable explaining it to your client, one, another hidden gem behind it, to use some of the terms we talk about, is it forces member interaction. And as personal trainers, the more we can interact and the more we can educate people, the more likely they may want to use our services. So it's kind of a side benefit because it's not something that people may naturally gravitate to. But once you show them how to use it, it is actually, as Wendy said, to me, safer than something where they're trying to touch buttons, trying to keep up with the preset speed. They are totally in control of the speed at all times. So that's why, to me, if uh, anybody, if I had my choice, I will always spend some time on the curve non-motorized. There's a, a time and a place for the motorized. But if I had to, like, the, I think the joke is if you had to take it, uh, one treadmill with you to a desert island, I would take the non-motorized. Yes, I don't need the power, but let's assume I had the power. I would just prefer this if I only had a choice for the majority of, of what we're doing. And like I said, there's like the one you see here from Technogym with the skill mill. It has multi-drive technology. So there's magnetic resistance. So you can start to walk against resistance and then you can even do sled push. So some of the curve non-motorized are just simply that. It's just a curve non-motorized deck with no additional bells and whistles, still phenomenal for the gait training, the walking speed. You can also do multi-planar exercises, which we'll talk about. And then there are some versions as you see here where you can adapt it with resistance and do sled pushes or even retro walking on that as well. I'm a huge sled push fan. We're gonna talk about that in a couple weeks, aren't we? We are. Now, this to me is another hidden gem, kind of that accidental exercise. So when I thought about this, I was at a private country club. So my average age was between 45 and 80. And I really, we talked about this before also, Wendy, the book Spark kind of sparked my uh, fascination with cognitive fitness. And really what I was trying to accomplish is can I get somebody's heart rate up, why they have to pay attention to a task? Or can they multitask? Well, you're going to see on these curved non-motorized treadmills, there is not a television. Reason being is you need to stay focused on what you're doing, which is phenomenal. You're more mentally engaged with what you're doing. So now you may not feel it like you will with local muscle fatigue and increased heart rate. But if we can wire up someone's brain, you would see more activity 
in the brain why they're doing something with an elevated heart rate like this because they're focused versus just sitting on a recline or recumbent bike because you could pedal even if you increase your heart rate you can kind of mentally check out because you do not have to be as focused as what you're doing so and i don't care if you're i was just on a phone with a, a medical professor um, actually the head of medicine for a ma major university and he and i were talking about this so even if you look at your athletic population, there's a huge correlation now to athletes that have concussions to lower body injuries seven to 10 days later. And they're starting to tie that with a lack of motor control. So yes, they might clear their concussion protocol, but maybe they don't truly fully have that wiring to control, to stabilize, to change direction and speed like they did before the concussion. So of course, the curved non-motorized treadmill could be a great way to bring that back in. Or you take someone 50, 60, 70, it's great to be in great shape cardiovascular. It's great to have muscle tone. But if you're not staying with your cognitive and you're starting to have a little bit of that decline from a cognitive standpoint, that's going to age us very, very quickly. So putting in cardio, that 20 minute threshold where we get the elevated heart rate with multitasking, we have seen that there's an increase in that key protein brain derived neurotropic factor, which is the fertilizer of the tissue, the, uh, the neurons in the brain. And research has shown that you can regenerate these, but it has to be with elevated heart rate and multitasking. So nothing could be safer or better. There's other things you could do, but I really think that that curved non-motorized treadmill is kind of missed when it comes to the cognitive side of things. So basically you're saying you got to think before you get on this treadmill. <laughs> Well, you're going to think once you're on it, and you're like, what was I thinking? No. <laughs> and, and those of you guys that haven't seen it, I know uh, Marty showed a picture, and we're going to show you some examples of some exercises. But, you know, there are different ways to to add resistance to it as well, as well as, you know, kind of help just it, it being your own body weight. And, Marty, I don't know if you kind of want to talk about some of that, because you did mention, you know, there's other, other factors, too. And I know we're talking – you know, specifically more about the skill mill, but that's the one that I yeah. have. That's the one we use, but you know, there are others out there. I know, you know, Woodway makes one um, and there are other companies. And so it's not like this is a plug, even though it is, I guess. But um, I find that, you know, that the, the different levels, and, and again, I know it's going to be a little bit different when we're in talking about the exercises, but can you kind of briefly go over like each, like uh, more about the, I don't want to call it a break because it's not, I mean, you are the break, but can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So again, um, in all transparency, my full-time role is vice president of education for techno gym, but Wendy and I would only pick a topic that has a scientific application when we bring it here. So yes, there are multiple curved treadmills. And if we're talking about the gate and the biomechanics, for the most part, it's going to be the same. Now we could look into the angle of the curve and things like that, but a self-propelled treadmill, non-motorized, you are still controlling the speed and you're still controlling the deceleration. Now, some products go into other features. So when we do talk about the skill mill, there is 10 levels of magnetic resistance. Now, here's the cool thing. It would be obvious to show that by adding magnetic resistance, you're going to be able to create a harder workout. But I'm going to reverse engineer this for a second. I was with a group of great personal trainers yesterday at a facility and we we're talking about this. So anytime we do something new, I don't care if it's a kettlebell swing, a plank, or non-motorized treadmill. When we introduce it, we should introduce it as an introduction and not part of necessarily their full training program because we want to give people an opportunity to learn it. We want to see how they do with it. And then we know where they are. And then we would implement it a little bit more in their future training programs. So the first time I introduce a non-motorized to somebody, I'm only going to maybe just see, can they control their speed? Can they get on? Can they get off? Do they feel comfortable? Where are they at from a coaching standpoint? So then I can program accordingly. So now due to the fact that the skill mill has the 10 levels of magnetic resistance for some people, that freedom of getting the belt moving quickly, they might be like, Whoa, wait a minute. What am I doing here? Which is awesome because you're seeing the central nervous system try to figure out control, right? So in theory, people would say, well, I would have no resistance because I want it to be easier on them. Well, are we attacking the muscular system, the cardiovascular system, or the nervous system, right? So if I'm only going to do micro doses of it at first, 
they're not going to be fatigued cardiovascular. They're not going to be fatigued muscularly. So I'm going to look at what the weakest link in that chain could be, which would be the central nervous system, the motor control. So I might give somebody a little bit of magnetic resistance so they can't get going a little too quickly until I teach them how to speed up, how to slow down, how to speed up, how to slow down. So a progression might be level two or three of magnetic resistance going back to level one then going to level zero where there's no magnetic resistance because now they can get their speed going faster. There's a little bit of variability there based on someone that might be 6'4", 250 versus someone 5'2", 110 because when they put their foot on the belt, obviously someone bigger would get that moving a little quicker. But the point is the magnetic resistance can be part of your simple to complex. So as you're introducing it very easy, very light and small doses, give them a little magnetic resistance so you kind of have a governor on the motor which is them. Then as they show you and earn control, you back off the governor so they can get going at their more natural speeds. Then you have the choice. Do I want to walk against resistance? Like, do I want to go for a long walk on the beach in the sand, right? That's harder biomechanically. So you can then start to add some resistance or put on more resistance and get into the sled push and really work on lower body power. So you can really have fun with that magnetic resistance. That's what I was hoping you would say, Marty. You know, I geek out on this kind of stuff and I'm like, oh, what is exactly, you know, behind this? And, and you know, and that's one of the reasons why we did this. And so if you guys are just joining Marty Miller and I today on the Master Instructor Roundtable, we're talking about the advantages of non-motorized treadmills. And there are, so, you know, this is some good information. So if you've missed anything thus far, go back, listen from the beginning. And, uh, and Marty's one of the best to talk about it because this is what he does. You know, besides working with us, of course. But right. um, <laughs> so, so let's go to the next slide here. And we're talking about some increased muscle activation on the curve non-motorized versus a traditional treadmill. So again, Marty, I know you've kind of talked about this, but I'm going to actually let you take this one as well. Sure. No, and again, it, the reason I do what I do with NASM is because I believe in the science. And again, the reason I have... It, decided to work for Technogym is because everything has to be scientifically based. But again, this research I'm talking about comes from that, but you can correlate that to other curved non-motorized treadmills. If you ask me if the research, obviously the research would be done on a certain product, but clearly you could apply some of this regardless of the brand. So going back to the motorized treadmill, if I pick seven miles an hour, the only thing I have to do is pick my foot up enough to where that belt goes underneath me and I'm in a comfortable stride. So Am I producing some of the force as I hit the ground and bring my leg through? Sure. But am I truly running at seven miles an hour biomechanically? Not really. Now, again, if you only have motorized treadmills, keep doing it. Nothing wrong with it. But just understand that biomechanically, it will be different. That's why some people who train on treadmills, then they go run outside like, oh, it's so hard outside. Well, let's assume that you had the same uh, gradient. Yeah, if you've been running seven miles an hour on a motorized and now you go run outside, you have to propel yourself at seven miles an hour, not just pick your foot up. So yes, there's going to be a differentiation in the training. So if it's going to be different, then clearly the muscle activation patterns have to be different as well. So on the non-motorized, you're actually physically grabbing the deck, pulling it at that speed to propel it so you can continue the movement of that deck. So that's the main difference. So you'll see there the difference in the muscle activation. Now, if I'm increasing muscle activation, I'm increasing caloric expenditure. If I'm increasing muscle activation, I'm challenging my cardiovascular system more. So again, a lot of benefits from it. And I just think sometimes people are like, oh, that's for just sprinting or whatever. Well, is it or isn't it? It just depends. But even walking, we've shown on a curved non-motorized, even without resistance, if you have the ability to, is still going to be more muscularly challenging. And I always say, if you haven't used it, that product is undefeated. It is in a good way. Like I said, it doesn't have to be as hard as I'm making it sound, right? But you will not beat that thing. Yeah. And I know, you know, working in a rehab facility, and again, this, you know, was not used with, with a, a piece of um, techno gym equipment. But, you know, when we first were introduced to this, this was a long time ago, like 20 years ago, we used this a lot with our athletes that were going through rehab. And for that exact same reason, Marty, it was teaching them how to use their own gait, their own speed, their own walking pattern, without the help of some motorized you know, belt at a certain level of speed, you know, it's trying to really work on proper movement mechanics. And so to me, it says a lot on a, everything. Like you said, it's not about 
sprinting. It was literally teaching them about their gait and their walking pattern and, you know, and making sure that they were maintaining good alignment. So, so no matter what avenue or the way that you're looking at this, think about what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And if there's a way that you can switch it up, I mean, you know, don't always do what's in the weight room. Can you do some stuff on the, you know, cardio equipment that's going to increase, like you said, muscle activation, as well as, you know, um, as well as proper mechanics, then, then use something along these lines, because you will get a great workout. It's super, super hard. And, um, and you, all you need is the treadmill. <laughs> that is it. Uh, there's that. <laughs> so let's move on. So Marty, I'm going to, I'll read this because I know you can explain a lot of the science behind it, but when we were looking at the increased metabolic demand, the curve platform has been demonstrated to alter the different requirements of submaximal running. So when we're talking about the physiological requirements of submaximal running. So this study showed that nine expert distance runners made a greater running effort on the curved treadmill in comparison to the motorized treadmill. So when you're running at six or running for six minutes at 50 percent, 65, 80 percent um, of the elastic threshold and the LT, um, you know, at that speed, then the oxygen uptake, heart rate and blood lactate and the rate of perceived exertion. So, again, one to ten, where are you? They were significantly greater for the curve versus the motorized. So do you want to go into more detail about that? Yeah, it's a lot of what we've talked about that I am the motor. So if I am the motor, just if you just think about it that way, I have to produce all the force required to run at any given speed. Where if I'm on a motorized, all I have to do is I'm required only to create the movement just enough to pick up my feet and let the belt pass underneath me. So when we just think about it that way, it would have to be easier to run mile per mile per hour on a motorized. So when you start to look at the physiological markers that anybody would research on looking at cardiovascular output is rate of perceived exertion, just which seems harder. Elevated heart rate. If I'm getting more muscles activated, my heart rate would have to be higher. Well, if my heart rate's higher, right, then I'm going to produce more lactate. I'm going to have a higher oxygen uptake. So all those things just kind of simply fall into place. But a lot of people just kind of overlook the beauty of the simplicity of a non-motorized treadmill but really is it non-motorized or is it just you're the motor yeah and i mean i guess the way you know when you're when you're trying to explain this to a client and and this is what i've used before is basically like you said you know you're the one that has to get the speed at a certain you know at a certain um mile per hour and then you have to maintain it so it's not just getting it up there. How long does it take you to get to seven miles an hour? And then how long can you maintain that with that, without dropping below seven or going above it? Like, how does your body react to that certain thing? When, to your point, when you're on a motorized, you set it there. And basically what you have to do is keep up with that. So you're just keeping up with the speed instead of actually being the actual producer of that speed. So yes, I never really said, hey, you are the motor, but that's my easiest way of explaining it to my clients. And they're like, oh, well, that seems a lot harder. Why don't we just do this other one instead? <laughs> so again, I'm I'm here to to make sure they're going to get more, you know, right. um, bang for their buck. So I'm like, well, do you want easy or do you want to do something that's going to challenge you? And then well, I let them make that decision. And when they say something that's easier, I'm like, well, you know what? That hurts my heart. And then they're like, all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, in two points that uh, you made me think of. So when someone drifts on a treadmill, right? You're like, no, 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 move forward. They're not at seven miles an hour anymore, right? Or they would stay put. So you've seen people where they drift to the back of the treadmill, then they come back up. They drift to the back of the treadmill. Well, on, a, on the non-motorized, you'd see six, nine, seven, one, seven, two, seven, oh. Because again, that would, and if you really had to lock in at seven, you're really making them hyper-focus on that, which is great. But then also when to your point of, well, which do you want the easier or the hard? It's like, well, at the end of the day, if you're looking to burn a amount of, amount of calories, do you want the 10 minute version or the 20 minute version? And they're like, I'll take the 10 minute version. Right. Yes. So in a sense, you're, you can get the same bang for your buck or more with less time. And efficiency of workouts is critical because not everybody has the time. So if I could get the same metabolic work done in half the time or maybe 20, you know, 75% of the time, that's a big attraction to a lot of people. Plus, 
I need to do anterior tib work. Well, I wouldn't need to do it as much if I'm doing that. Right. Plus I'm getting my glute bridges in. Plus I'm getting a standing dynamic plank, getting my posture in. So to me, a lot of bang for the buck. Me too, Marty. Hmm. Great minds think alike. <laughs> and if, if you're joining Marty Miller and I today on the Master Instructor Roundtable, we're talking about the advantages of non-motorized um, treadmills. So we've talked about why we use it, what we like about it, that you are going to burn more calories. You're going to use more muscles. It also helps with activation of certain muscles that are usually weak when we see the feet turn out, the arches cave in, um, as well as even knee valgus. Uh, we core. So we're, we're training a lot of different muscles when we're utilizing this piece of equipment itself. But, um, you know, again, what popped us or popped this topic up, not only does Marty love talking about it, but there was a question that came to us and was like, I don't understand. <laughs> well, I've got these two treadmills. What's the difference? And we're like, you know what? That's what today's all about. So I thought you were gonna say Marty loves talking and put a period there. So I was like, Ooh, and mic drop. Yes, that is a fact. Um, I was just trying to tell them the other fact of why this topic was chosen. <laughs> it's all love. I get it. Um, well, and again, I know we kind of hit on this before talking about increased safety, but you know, when you're reading a, this particular like snippet of a study that was found, and all of the information of, of where we've gathered this inform or these studies is listed below on the slides. But this study from 2011 compared foot pressure when walking at 1.3, 2.23, and 3.13 miles per hour on at three different treadmills. And when you're reading through this, again, the results basically showed that while the forefoot pressures were not different between the three treadmills, the rear foot ones were significantly less on the curved versus the two motorized at all three speeds, which I found significant. I, I found that very interesting. Again, Marty and I are both research nerds, so I love I love stuff like this. And on the contrary, there appears to be no difference with the individual's step length between the treadmills at a given speed. So when you have to try to reverse engineer, okay, the why? Well, going back to the accidental end exercise, if I have to get my hip into extension and I have to you know, propel myself, one, I'm going to put my foot in the right position, and I'm also going to have more of the right muscles activated, whether it's the glute, quad, and ham ratio. Because at the end of the day, if those muscles aren't firing and I'm hitting a deck, right, there's going to be more force driven through the body, and it would be what's in contact with the ground. The other thing, too, is you'll see a slight curve in the back of the treadmill, too. So, again, if you combine the muscle activation and the angle of that, it's safer than just doing it on a flat. Now, I'm not saying – and on not all uh, regular treadmills are built the same. Trust me on that. We could get into a whole other thing about the modern <laughs> mechanic on decks. But without that being said, when we look at people who want to work out for longer periods of time and not have, as I always say, the itis show up, why would I not want to potentially use this if we know that there's less pressure through the rear foot, but there's more activation in the posterior chain? I, that's a good question. Why would you? <laughs> no idea. So this is a picture of a ton of different exercises that I'll let Marty kind of talk us through. And, um, just think about this. We're talking about multi-planar. So again, all three planes of motion with endless exercise options. People think that a treadmill, it's just sagittal plane. You're moving front, you know, or maybe you can turn around and do some other stuff. That is not the case because I know even for myself, I do a lot of frontal plane movements. There's a lot of different things that you can do again on all three planes of motion. And then if you go back to the slide, you can see these are just a few of these examples. And as Marty says, this is Instagrammable. So why wouldn't you? Because if you're doing something different, it's got to be on social media or you never did it. And then, of course, one of the reasons that I really like this, too, is you can use this in all the phases of the OPT model. Again, I talked about how I personally used it um, and it, with physical therapists per doctor recommendations on, you know, on their rehab pro, you know, uh, programming and for corrective exercise. And then of course, again, with all of our athletes for performance enhancement. So again, working on speed and working on, you know, foot strikes and gait and, and then power production. Yeah. And each one of those by, uh, if you saw the video is a different exercise. So it's not just a few, you can get very, very creative and you can do lateral shuffles. You can do 
karaoke. So you get that upper body disassociation. You can do one legged exercise and look at the speed or the wattage left leg versus right leg. You can do retro walking, which is great for, you know, if you're looking to target the quads a little bit sled pushes, one arm sled push. So there's counter rotation, just it's endless. And of course, if, if it's interesting to people, they're more likely to gravitate to you. Or like you said, when you could make it to where it's content people want to look at and understand because they wouldn't naturally get it themselves. So Instagrammable or the way I looked at it is it's, it's a way to in, force member interaction. The more members I interact with in a facility, the more likely they're going to want to that. Well, what can you teach me? Because I didn't know that. Yeah. And again, you know, too, it depends on where you work for those of you guys, um, you know, that are, are thinking, OK, it's busy and, and it's Monday and everyone's on the floor. You can also do like your farmer walks or you can do different things like that on these types of treadmills. So you can be as creative as you want to be as long as it's safe. It makes sense and they can do it without compensation. Not like you haven't heard me say that a few times, right? <laughs> Never. That's the first time. <laughs> Maybe today. <laughs> yes. So basically the key takeaways is there's many advantages, as you guys know, um, to these non-motorized treadmills. If you have seen them, but you've been scared to use them, try them out on yourself first before you program it for your clients. Always safety first. But as Marty said, you know, these can be programmed for all of your clients and their needs specifically. No matter what they need, this, there's so many different advantages. And then, of course, we're always going to end with it should be fun. Fun for you to program, fun for you to show, but then also fun for the client. Right. And trust me, they will really enjoy it. it. They will see great results. And you never have to run on this. It's not a treadmill, even though you'll see a lot of that. Someone's speed might be walking at two miles an hour and you eventually get them to three and a half or four, which would almost be a, up to 100 percent increase in their speed. Phenomenal. Don't think that it has to be a run. It's just use the advantage of why these were built and then understand that science, communicate it to the right level to your members. They'll appreciate it and they will understand and be very helpful, ha uh, happy that you've put it into their programming. Well, and, and I'm hoping that this is going to help a lot of the trainers, too, because if you didn't get a chance to sit down with the people that brought in these treadmills that showed you all of these different things that you could do on the treadmill, of course, you're going to think that all you're going to do is walk and run. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's uh, webinar. I know I did. I always learned so much from you, Marty, but especially on topics like these. Um, so, you know, hey, thank you for that. But if you have questions, I, I, you know, that you want to actually send my way, always feel free to contact me via email at wendy.bats at nasm.org, or you can find me on Instagram at wendy.bats13. And then my information will pop up right here. So Instagram is dr.martymiller72. Email is marty.miller at nasm.org. Feel free to be very specific because I'm around these products all the time. Happy to shoot a video, throw it up there. Uh, I need to do more of that, but I do have the advantage of being around these amazing products. So I'm happy to share some programming ideas. So Wendy, as always, it's been a pleasure. Yes. And I know that both of us thank everybody for attending and can't wait to see them again next week. <laughs>